What is a human life worth? This morning, the British ambassador in Berlin handed the German government a final note stating that unless we heard from them by 11 o'clock, that they were prepared at once to withdraw their troops from Poland, a state of war would exist between us. had anticipated the destruction of harbors. So in the months before D-Day, a great fleet had been assembled along the English coast, the strangest fleet that ever put to sea. Giant floating cement blocks, each literally as big as a house, stood ready in the harbors. These blocks, called Phoenixes, were a British innovation. Each had its own specially trained CB towing crew. Every Phoenix was divided into compartments equipped with sea valves, so it could be sunk in a few minutes. By sinking 20 or 40 of these blocks end to end, an enormous breakwater would be formed in a few hours. Towed by tugs, this incredible armada began to cross the channel the morning of D-Day. The towing crews stood by the tow lines constantly. A sudden plunge of the cement mountains could snap the towing cables like twine. No one but a seaman can realize the difficulty of towing these heavy, plunging concrete giants across the choppy channel. When the phoenixes reached the Normandy beach, there was a heavy sea run. As each phoenix was swung into position, its crew opened the sea valves. One after another, the great blocks sank to form the giant breakwater that gradually grew out of the sea. And under its lee, the cargo vessels moved in toward the shore. But the phoenix breakwater was only part of the gigantic allied plan. In order to handle the hundreds of cargo vessels, the engineers had determined to build a huge artificial harbor, complete with wharves, docks, piers, and anchorages. The Phoenix Breakwater formed one side of this harbor. Another fleet, manned by Navy crews, set out from England. A fleet of old ships, no longer considered serviceable, with explosive charges placed in their holds. These ships were maneuvered into a long line, like the Phoenixes. Then, at a signal, the charges were exploded. The ship sank to form an additional breakwater. 
a wall of ships, enough vessels to form a small merchant fleet, sunk to provide protection for their comrades bringing in supplies. All who come to a place like this feel the enormity of the loss. Yet for so many there is a marker that seems to sit alone. They come looking for that one cross, that one star of David, that one name. Behind every grave of a fallen soldier is a story of the grief that came to a wife, a mother, a child, a family, or a town. A World War II orphan has described her family's life after her father was killed on the field in Germany. My mother, she said, had lost everything she was waiting for. She lost her dreams. There were an awful lot of perfect linen tablecloths in her house that never got used. So many things being saved for a future that was never to be. Each person buried here understood his duty, but also dreamed of going back home to the people and the things he knew. Each had plans and hopes of his own and parted with them forever when he died. The day will come when no one is left who knew them when no visitor to this cemetery can stand before a grave remembering a face and a voice. The day will never come when America, forget, when America forgets them. Our nation and the world will always remember what they did here, what they gave here. We stand on a lonely windswept point on the northern shore of France. The air is soft, but 40 years ago at this moment, the air was dense with smoke and the cries of men, and the air was filled with the crack of rifle fire and the roar of cannon. At dawn on the morning of the 6th of June, 1944, 225 rangers jumped off the British landing craft and ran to the bottom of these cliffs. Their mission was one of the most difficult and daring of the invasion to climb these sheer and desolate cliffs and take out the enemy guns. The Allies had been told that some of the mightiest of these guns were here, and they would be trained on the beaches to stop the Allied advance. The Rangers looked up and saw the enemy soldiers, the edge of the cliffs, shooting down at them with machine guns and throwing grenades, and the American Rangers began to climb. They shot rope ladders over the face of these cliffs and began to pull themselves up. When one Ranger fell, another would take his place. When one rope was cut, a ranger would grab another and begin his climb again. They climbed, shot back, and held their footing. Soon, one by one, the rangers pulled themselves over the top, and in seizing the firm land at the top of these cliffs, they began to seize back the continent of Europe. 225 came here. After two days of fighting, only 90 could still bear arms.
what is a human life worth? What is a human life worth? It's not an easy question once you give up the idea that life is priceless.